and welcome to the Gym Owners Fitness Business Podcast, proudly supported by FitRec Fitness Registration for Fitness Professionals and Life Fitness Australia, the number one choice for innovative club member equipment experience. Today, I'm speaking to James Allender. James has grown up on the front line of the fitness and leisure industry. He started his career in 1998 at his local leisure centre. Since then, he has worked alongside leading brands such as the YMCA, Belgravia Leisure, Genesis Health Clubs and New South Wales Health, just to mention a few. Today, James, through his role as CEO at Active Exchange, is committed to empowering data to shape a more informed, connected, and active sector. Good afternoon, James. G'day, Mel. Thanks for having us. You're very, very welcome. Well, it's certainly been an interesting 18 months or so, hasn't it? What a ride. I don't think it's over yet either. I mean, and only today, I think there's another snap lockdown in, uh, in Brisbane. So wow. It's wow. going to be an interesting road ahead for 2021 still. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, and I've sort of said that to people floating through the club. I, I feel the lockdowns aren't quite over. As long as they're short and sharp and we can get back to business and mm. we, we don't get a repeat of 2020 because I must admit the first, the first lockdown – uh, though it sounds a little bit, I don't know, you know, saying it was a little bit of a novelty. Hey, you know, we're in lockdown. We'll yeah. do this and we'll do that. The second lockdown was quite crucifying for some people. So I certainly don't want to see people have to relive that again. No, not at all. We were only, I was only reflecting that just last week it was the the anniversary of, of the you know the nationwide lockdown and. I remember my, my days and, and hours really back then, you know, such a cascading effect across everyone's lives. So, yeah, I think we're in a much better place today and, and agree. Small, short lockdowns to keep everything else going, I think, is probably going to be the reality for us for, for, for the time being. But, yeah, small, short ones uh, and everything else continuing. It sounds good to me. And we're well prepared too now, so I think we're not going to go into this blind if it does happen again. We're very yeah. much a well prepared industry, which leads us to uh, this yeah. afternoon's conversation. And we're talking about you know recovery from state to state and, and what's been going on and and what you've seen been going on and and the you know the analytics and data that you've been collating. And uh, we crossed very quickly on a conversation on LinkedIn where people were talking about, you know, post-COVID and what we should be um, doing and, and what we think we're going to be seeing. And as you know, I'm fairly vocal in the industry. And I'm like, we're, we're well and truly past post-COVID. Our doors are open and we need to get on with business. So let's talk about what has Active Exchange been visualising through recovery so far in 2021 from state to state? Yeah, yeah. Look, it's um, definitely looking at what we have in front of us. I think we can help this conversation significantly. Um, you know, we're, we're holding, or we have Australia and New Zealand's largest database of venues and, and memberships that are being tracked really hourly. Um, whilst we aggregate the data on a monthly basis and produce the insights. Um, COVID, COVID allowed us a bit of time while everyone was shut to really fine tune what we have and, and make sure that you know, as things reopen, we'd be able to provide really tangible information. So you know, what we're seeing with what we track, uh, and this is you know, across all the states and territories and you know, membership, group fitness, um, everything, Return rates are sitting now at about 70%. So 69% of members pre-COVID are back. Um, so that, that still leaves a, a gap of 31%. Now, that's obviously a national average, and if you break that down state by state, it's different. You know, Western Australia is, is nearly up to 100, 120% uh, you know, return rate of membership, so wow. you know, growing uh, in, in addition to the members coming back. Um, that's tailed off a bit in Feb 
like a typical trend that we would normally see um, with, with growth and, and seasonality around it. And obviously at the other end of the scale is Victoria, where you know they've only just started to come back to levels above 50% with members returning. So that's the first sort of insight that we're, we're generating is members returning and members not returning to their clubs. Uh, and you know, that average as a starting point shows there's still a lot of work to do across the states. So, James, let me ask you then. So we've got WA like 120% returning and, and growing. So, But then we look at Victoria who we're saying 50% and growing. Now, besides the climate, mm. what, what, what is your data telling you? What is the actual difference? Why are 50% of Victoria holding back yet WA are, are pretty much pushing the doors open to get into the clubs? Yeah, look, look, I think it's, it's, there's two questions, or two, sorry, two, two discussions around that. First is, I think in general, the economies are very different. You know, the, the, the West Australian economy has really pushed on and reopened earlier and had, didn't have the impact of the second lockdown like Victoria did. Um, so if we, we look past that and then we start looking at what's happening in membership, it's really interesting seeing the different demographics that aren't coming back. Uh, and that are also changing their behaviour. And this is this is really, I guess, the essence of what we're about is not just benchmarking data, but starting to provide insights and predictive modelling to help with that. Um, I think the, the what we see what we're seeing, you know, at a, a nationwide trend is a very different um, choice in behaviour as members are coming back. They're choosing to do different classes to what they were doing before. Um, you know, um, the over 65s have, have, have not come back to the numbers that we were hoping um, or predicting, and they're also choosing to do different activities, which starts to help you understand what does what does what do you do next? You know, what what programs do you need to adjust? What times are you delivering things? You know, we've seen a, I think you know, in in other states they've adjusted their timetables more quickly and created accessibility and created new programs, whereas I think now it's a chance to, to look at that within other states and think about what, how is the programming adjusted, what are people's behaviours like. You know, um, in, in New South Wales, uh, there's some businesses that have just made the decision not to come back until September this year, so that means that whole workforce can do seven, eight a.m. classes or middle of the day classes or early afternoon classes, and it's just that whole shift in seeing the customer uh, I think is what we're seeing happen quicker in other parts of the country. See, I never ever thought about those that haven't returned to the workplace. You mm -hmm. just sort of assume because we're all open, everybody's back at work. Um, mm -hmm. So when you talk about those those businesses or those sectors that aren't opening till September, who are those businesses? Um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, the finance sector a lot is is has re reshifted. You know, the banking um, industry. Um, a lot of those industries have sort of made the decision that it's not necessary to be in the office five days a week anymore, and they can be um, deliver their services differently. Um, you know, on, on, to take that a step further, I think Westpac only last week announced that it's closing down, I forget the number of branches, but it was a significant number where they're readjusting how they do business. So whilst everyone's back to work or the you know, roles are opening, it's not yeah, how people use their facilities is changing dramatically. And the kind of insights that we're able to track sort of starts to highlight that. It starts to look at, you know, which age group by age group, gender by gender, what are they doing, what aren't they doing, when are they doing it, and the, and the businesses that are really getting on the front foot and adjusting how they deliver their services are, are reaping the benefits. Yeah, so I did a, I did a survey, James, um, in my club, and I only really did it with our group fitness sector. And so I threw the survey out there and I sort of said to them, uh, what times, you know, do you want to come to class? What classes do you want? Blah, 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 blah. And I gave them, you know, well-being choices and that sort of thing. And it was really interesting where two or three years ago, they would have been, oh, please, you know, put a five o'clock class on, you know, for 30 minutes, which we've always done. But now they're asking for classes at four o'clock, 4.30 in the afternoon that only go for 20 or 30 minutes. And can you put well-being classes on at two o'clock in the afternoon? And it's almost like they're creating their own agenda, their own timetable. And things like 
I can remember when seven o'clock of the night time was a really popular choice for people who got off the train coming in from Melbourne. And it's almost like now, no, we don't want to come at seven o'clock at night. It's the middle of the night. Yeah, and absolutely. And so our numbers are showing that. You know, looking at the six to seven and eight pm time slots at being at twenty percent of capacity what they used yeah. to, but the but the nine, ten, eleven, and twelves at two hundred percent. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. And I'm sitting down actually this week doing our winter time table, and I'm looking at the numbers. You know, of people coming through the door since we've reopened, and I'm sort of going, geez, you know. These 4.30 and 5 o'clock ones that I was putting on to see what was going to happen, they're staying on the timetable and the amount of people, the amount of people that have asked us to run back-to-back 20-minute classes and 30-minute classes has been phenomenal. So where I would have put well-being on, you know, like at 7 o'clock at night, now I'm actually looking at putting them on at what was our peak time at quarter past 6 at night. So it's really been interesting to sit back and watch this feedback come through. When you say the the demographic is um, choosing different types of workouts, do you also mean they're shifting away from the fitness industry and perhaps going a bit more outdoor or perhaps they're walking away from their traditional weight session, say, in the, the gym area and moving into a class or doing vice versa? What are you seeing there? Yeah, so, so what we're seeing is particularly in the, you know, the over 30s and over 60s, a change in the type of program they do. So, so we track um, at a transactional basis the member, who they are and what they do and what they do day in, day out. And what we've seen change pre and post COVID is a real push or an uplift in doing mind-body classes. Yeah. Um, more around yoga, Pilates, that, that, that product, you know, in comparison to a typical maybe dance aerobics program or a high intensity program and shifting more around that, that well-being aspect. And that's just what the data is showing us. So, you know, we're, we're, we're over 65s, I think, of, you know, there's a 15% drop in, you know, well, not high impact, but the dance exercise programs and a 8% increase in Pilates and yoga in those programs. So, so the, you know, when you can look, when you can drill down at a specific segment and understand what they're wanting to do and what they're going into, again, where this correlates back to helping a, a business owner maintain their, their revenue and look at the future is we know that a member stays 3.9 months longer if they do Group X. Yeah. But but what group X they do vary significantly in the length of time they stay. And, and we try and visualise that for our partners really quickly so they can look at that and then make decisions about their programming or make decisions about what they how they contact their membership base. So it's not just about predicting dropout, it's looking at the whole life cycle of the customer and looking at who's the optimal customer and what's the optimal experience for them over time and how that shifts as they um, as they as they shift over time with you, um, and visualising that. So, will I be right in saying then, if I was to say to you, "Hey, James, I'm seeing a lot of behaviour change in my club, and I really need to to hit the nail on the head with this and not guess anymore, or put surveys out there that only thirty percent or twenty percent of my mm-hmm. members, you know, fill in," yeah, I can get you to come in and do a report on my club. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we do, we do it in a lot of different ways, Mel. And I think you've used our, our, our YPM before where we can look at dots on maps, an investment planning model that tries to predict, you know, the optimal location and, and understand competition and then predict the realistic membership base and, and even the product range. But on the flip side, we can do that in reverse and, and, and look at your product mix and look at who your customers are and who they are and, and do that. We actually only just did that for a regional Victorian council who run their own venues who exactly that, wanted to understand what's happening and what's changed and how that compares to the sector because, you know, you, you can really, when you start to benchmark and, and look at, you know, how, the, how does my location compare and what, what does my demographic look like in comparison to the state or to the country, starts to really help you make educated decisions. Because it's not the case anymore, is it, of, you know, you pick up the latest um, 
fitness business report or the latest glossy magazine and they might go, hey, the latest trend for 2021 is hit every gym in Australia has to have a hit class. It's not like that anymore, is it? No, well, the, 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 um, definitely what we're seeing is the market's matured. You know, there's, there's a lot more options out there now and it's, it's actually really hard as, a, as an operator or a business owner to make those decisions because it can be, there's a lot to choose from and, you know, trying to do that in isolation um, is risky. Yeah. So we, we try and take a bit of the risk out for our partners and, and use data at scale to help in a location or for a group of sites. You know, we do that a lot. So the, it's the same story in each state. So no, no state is really different, Irris, you know, irrespective of how they're recovering. Every club mm -hmm. owner's pretty much got this story on their hands at the moment, haven't they? The demographic has changed and they need to meet the needs of the demographic in order to keep the club doors open, correct? Correct, correct. And I think that's, that's you know, uh, you, can't, you can't argue with that. And I think there's, there's more risk than ever, Mel. We're, what we're, uh, another interesting insight that we've uncovered um, through doing our deep dive is, is, is two things. Firstly, you know, during COVID and post-COVID, um, you know, what we, were, we had a, an algorithm that was predicting member risk and, and that was based on a whole series of factors, you know, looking at who they are and a deep dive around their, their appetite, but it relied on vis visitation. Now, that visitation changed dramatically post-COVID. And we had to take stock and, and, and put that on ice for a bit while we worked with our partners. And what we did was just look at who hasn't come back and who has come back but isn't visiting. And we put that into the into the insights for the, for the, for the partners. And that helped us at a starting point. But now that visitation has come back and, and we've seen that sort of get to parity again where the algorithm's right. But now it's about looking at all the different um, decisions that are in them from that product mix because the visitations are coming back. What we've seen is the second key insight is members prior to COVID took 47 days to cancel. So that's, that's on average. So that, that's a scary stat in itself. So that's 47 days on average that it took them since they last came to the gym to cancel. That has gone down to 26 days now. Wow. So it's, it's almost half. So that just gives you another dramatic effect around I've got decision making, product mix, adjusting programs, products and services. You know, there's a lot of risk in all of that, and and we also uh, also we're hearing that there's great, you know, we're getting great sales. Uh, I think there's a lot of risk in that as well because what we're seeing is a lot of those are uh, race to the bottom sales where people have been able to be freed up from their contract or change because change can happen easier post COVID. But decision making still is, is, is the thing to be, be conscious of because whilst you might have an influx of people, are they your true customer? Are they the customers that you want and, and that you'll keep? You know, the average life of a customer in the leisure industry in Australia is nearly 800 days. That's a long membership to have in a leisure facility. But that's, again, that's, that's dropping dramatically at the moment because of that decision making and, and the, the people leaving sooner than ever before. Yeah, I, I have to honestly say as a club owner, though it's been great to see an influx of new members coming in, I'm also seeing a big lifestyle change in members who have left our club, you know, whether they're moving back to Melbourne or moving back to parents or a yeah. job change or, you know, there, there are those people walking in the door and there are more of them, you know, than there were last year. So, you know, when people go, oh, that's great, you know, you, you signed up X amount of members in, in January, I go, yeah, but we also had this amount of members move on. And yeah. so it's a matter of knowing what's going on in your club, which is what you're doing for club owners. But I just want to ask you something, 26 days cancelling a membership, do you have the data on what's the most, what, what's the most, oh, I shouldn't use the word popular, but what's the most popular reason people are cancelling their membership? Um, it's a great question. It's uh, we, we don't have the answer on that data today, but it's definitely something that we could do a deep dive on. What what we do know is why what's making people stay. Um, so so often that exit cancellation in terms of the data collected isn't great. So to give you an honest answer on that, it's going to be a bit tricky. But what we have been doing for for quite some time is looking at member counts 
and interventions or attention tools used on people before they leave. So we're predicting, yeah, at scale, the people who have come back and who aren't using it, who are, who are at risk, and then we're working with our partners to get in front of them and help them be saved. Without a doubt, you know, eighty percent of all retention tools is a face-to-face -face session with with with, with one of your team, getting them back in and getting them buddied up with a professional who can help guide them through their program. And so, you know, that that compared to free time or an extension, it's not about that uh, for the customer. It's about contact with the facility and, and being supported because um, so much has changed for them personally. Well, that, that's the assumption. But what we're seeing for the data is wanting that face-to-face -face contact with an employee. And this is where it's a little bit of a, a trap for some club owners because I totally agree with what you're saying. But the club owners have got to have the manpower there to have the extra staff on the gym yep. floor to do that face-to-face. -face. But the problem is gyms were first to close, last to open, and for a lot of clubs, the money's not in the bank to do that and job keepers stopped yesterday, as we all know. Yeah. So what's, what's your answer to those clubs? In saying that, Mel, what, what you could be doing is at least identifying who's the most at risk and not trying to do that for everyone but yeah. for the ones that need it. And that's where data... And evidence becomes really important. Is that we're not we're not suggesting that, that that this has to happen for all of your members, but there's a good 11 or 12 percent of them that it has to happen for, and that's where you put your tailored effort. All right. So can you just walk us through for those that aren't quite sure how Active Exchange works? I ring you and I say to you, look, James, I want you to come in. I need some um, insights on what's going on in my club. I, I want to know who's most likely to cancel. I want to know what time slots are going to be popular in my group fitness studios um, and obviously the choice of programming that they would like. What do you do from that moment I start that conversation with you? Yeah, it's, a, it's um, firstly, we, we, we love those calls because we, we're here to really help and guide and, and, I, and we understand how confusing uh, this can all be. But the most important part is to sit down and understand how you are tracking data in your venue. And so we would do a bit of a, an assessment and an analysis on that. And what we would what we would typically do is, is try and sit down and get you into the, a, a, an ongoing kind of six month program where we're not just ingesting your data in a safe way, in a secure way, but really helping understand how does it how, how is it administered through your venues and through your facilities to make sure that when we push it into our system, it then spits out insights that are really meaningful for you. So you've got to you've got to understand, Mel, you know that that call is a great one, but standards in data create the integrity and the accuracy of the work we do. So we can do one-off reports and static sort of reports around we, where we look at data. They can be helpful, but what will really become help, uh, more, more of a value add for partners is when they are getting rolling refreshes of information that create observations and understand or analyze trends. So month to month, quarter by quarter. So we would sit down, just to recap, assess what you have, figure out how to get it in, in a standard way that creates benchmarks and comparisons to the sector, and then wash it into an ongoing account that allows you to look at that over time. But on, on, in addition, if that's not where, how you want to sort of attack it first and you just want to get a bit of a baseline assessment, we can do that too and produce an offline report. They're the two ways that we typically work, either an account as a subscription or a static one-off report. And is this something that I can use as a competitive analysis against, yeah. you know, obviously my competition in town? Yeah, so, so you can use it in a way that, uh, I mean, we, we wouldn't, we don't ever share data between organisations. All we create is an understanding of market position. We share, you know, what are the highlights from a, from a comparison across the sector. And then we look at, you know, what are you doing from a program and what's, what is the market doing? But they're all sector averages. You would then need to, you know, sit down and look at specifically at a comparer and see if they're doing what the sector's doing or doing what you're doing and do a bit of that analysis. But what we're providing is an assessment of you and how you compare to the sector. We also provide a bit of an understanding about what is the optimal uh, area for you to grow your facility. So yes, things like our um, 
predictive modelling then leads into our investment planning reports, which actually start to look at hotspots around the country for fitness demand. So you might look at it and go, well, I'm actually just saturated here and there is actually no opportunity for growth, but just up the road or in a different part of a, an area, there's a great opportunity for me. Maybe that's where I deliver some ancillary services or open that pop-up that I've been thinking about for some time. But it's really sort of using the data to help present some options. So touching on that, what sort of um, what have you witnessed? You know, in the last say the last sec- the last half of twenty twenty and the start of twenty twenty one in terms of opportunities that have been taken up in the fitness industry and so far are going along really well. Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's. it's uh, it's a hard one because a lot of sort of got back to business and just been trying to cope with that. Yeah. I think where, where we've seen or where I've seen uh, things a bit different is yeah, the, the merging of the online and in-store experience and not having them work independently of each other. And, and that, that's, that's definitely been a, a, a positive and I think that's going to that's gonna cause some thinking process over the next six months about how you really merge all that together. And I think that's one of the challenges for the industry and for some of the leading providers, you know, uh, between now and the end of the year. Um, because, you know, in that six months, there was apps and this explosion of the online experience um, without really connecting the dots of, of the in-store experience, which obviously, you know, has, has a strong commercial position in, in, in your day-to-day business. Um, but yeah, I mean, Mel, I've been really impressed with how you've been able to, to rebound down there and, and, and try and get back to business. What, what are you seeing locally in, in, in your region? Oh, well, in our region, we actually had three gyms open through COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gonna love that. Gonna love that. So we had one um, club. <laughs> yeah, we had one club that doesn't um, do group fitness open up a second location. Yeah. Um, and I think that that was probably on the cars before the first lockdown, and they they just pretty much had to keep moving forward. Uh, and then we saw some young people open up uh, a very swish little um, studio, uh, and we've also seen another functional training. Uh, fitness franchise come to town and we believe that there's another two brands coming to our town in 2021 outside of people taking up opportunities like that and I totally get why they're doing that a lot of people lost their their jobs through COVID and they feel the only way they're going to be able to control things is by being their own boss for me in the club as a club owner definitely you know the over 50s took longer to come back to the club I think being one of those people over 50, I think people came back into the group fitness room because people like myself were in there teaching and they felt safe. If she's in there doing it, it should be okay. I found that the demand for Pilates, bar and yoga is very, very strong, very, very strong. And I'll tell you what's been a little bit different in our club is the amount of parents wanting to bring in their teenage kids Mm. to do workouts with them for mental health reasons. Absolutely. So this is something that club owners need to take a really big step back and have a look at. There is a large majority of parents out there that have children that haven't coped at all and they're wanting them to come along to the club. And so you're going to have to look at flexible memberships and actual flexible policies and procedures on allowing them into the club because these parents need to help their kids and they're relying on the gyms to do that. Definitely the 20 to 30 minute group fitness classes, people say don't be silly when I talk to other club owners. I'm saying no, these people are asking for it and they've been doing it anyway when they attend your launch nights. Functional training, um, if I was a club owner now going out into social media and I I was wanting to advertise my functional training classes, I'd stay away from advertising them to those that were doing them 2019. I would be advertising them to your deconditioned males. So my insights, I had a look on Facebook this morning and my insights for men 25 to 56 is so high. I think it was something like 64 to 67% were looking at my ads when I was advertising functional training as opposed to women. I then put up you know, a bar or Pilates thing, and then those numbers 
um, you swap the genders over and obviously it's the females looking at that. There's a big market of deconditioned men out there that want mm -hmm. help and club owners have got to tap into them. The fit people will come to your club anyway and they will go wherever they want, but there's a yeah. big market of deconditioned people out there that want to come to clubs. you just got yeah. to put the right stuff out there for them. Oh, I think you're spot on, though, those two points. And because and, and those deconditioned, deconditioned men have got time back right now. Yep. And, and, and then they've also got the reality or reminder around mental health. So the last 12 months, it's been all about mental health. It's just how we've been able to cope and get through this as a community. And I think that that relationship with children is, is, is a great example of, you know, by deep diving on your own membership and your location, you know, utilising things like the Active Exchange you know, network of not just data around membership. So, you know, the, the whole ecosystem that we've built allows you to understand who is your market, what percentage of that market you know is, is likely to use your services, and then how do you adjust the programs for them and look at optimal timetable and optimal pricing and all those things? Because you know, but we know, um, and it's because we've been tracking things like social value in leisure centres that fifty percent of the work we do through membership yeah, tackles mental health. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I agree with that, and you know, it's really funny because. Though everyone, you know, says 2020 was about mental health, sorry, but the recovery process is going to be another five years. Yeah, absolutely. Because this, right. yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not just a financial impact. You know, we've got a generation of young people coming through that this has mentally scarred, and it's going to be, it's going to be a part of their, 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 you know, their genetics for the next 10, 15, 20 years. It's going to be part of how they raise their family and um, how they tackle issues later on in life. There, there are people out there going to carry the COVID, um, you know, luggage with them for, for a long, long time. And so we yeah. need to be constantly reminding ourselves of that. As I said to you before, James, the young, fit people, they're going to go wherever they want. I've always, yeah. you know, it took me a long time to understand that market and what I know about my own club is I feel that our club is a starting point for a lot of people. They come to our club because they're unfit or, you know, marriage breakdown or whatever the issue may be. They get the confidence up, they lose the weight, they get fit, they stay fit and it's okay for them to leave us and go, you know, maybe to um, body fit or to F45. It's okay for them to do that. That's their stepping stone with their confidence um, and a lot of the time they come back and a lot of the time they don't. But then another group come through our club and start their journey with us. And some stay forever. We've had people that have been with us for 17 years. And then there's that you know small percentage of people that then move on. But we're part of the process of helping them improve their lives. And I think once you know you're what your business is about, then you can make great choices. But obviously a lot of people would benefit highly by getting, you know, the active exchange people through to help them really understand their business. Well, I think in all that as I was listening to you, Mel, I just, just you know, I reminded myself that, you know, the, the opportunity here with the values that have shifted in Australia is that, you know, prior to COVID, and it's probably still very much similar numbers, but you know, twenty percent of adults had a membership at a, at a facility. Well, the opportunity now is to get that to 35 percent over the couple of years ahead, and really, you know, not accept the norm, and to really understand who is your market, who are the, who's not your market, and how do you diversify to, to grow that share of what, what's a member in Australia? Because that, to me, is the the opportunity here is to is to take stock and, and, and sit back and, and develop new things, new products and services to, to get you know, more than one in five Australians as a member of a, of a facility. So, so true. Now, we are coming, I mean, I could talk for quite a long time on this, as we all know, but anyway, we are, we are coming to the end of the podcast, but I'll just ask you a couple of quick questions, James. Obviously, we're all hanging out for a person, to person fitness business event, aren't we all? <laughs> so can you just tell our listeners, where will Active Exchange be popping up in 2021? What events are you hoping to be at? Oh, look, aren't we looking forward to a few of those? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, yeah, uh, definitely, um, 
yeah, we're, we're, we're at, in and around different events. So for the fitness um, business sort of network, we'll definitely be at Phylex at the end of the year. We're definitely uh, looking at um, a couple of those those similar events. There seems to be a few of them that are all coming up around October, November at the end of the year. Um, and we'll be going along to, to be a, a, not, not a delivery vehicle at um, the Fitness Summit, but we'll definitely be there in attendance, the Fitness and Technology Summit in June. Um, and then we're at a series of other events such as the National Sports Convention in Melbourne, um, the Parks and Leisure Australia Conference, because obviously um, Active Exchange doesn't just work in fitness and, sport and, and leisure, we work across sport and um, recreation and all those other vehicles. So we've got a pretty busy conference agenda. Um, but we're we're yeah, trying to trying to spread ourselves um, efficiently this year. Well, hopefully, um, I will catch up with you in person at one of those events, and hopefully, you'll be at Sean Crenz's event in November, which is the fitness and wellness. Um, yes, we'll summit. be there for sure. Yeah, and I'm look really looking forward to that. Now, just before I get James to leave his details, so you can get in touch with him. I did do some work with Active Exchange at the end of 2019. wasn't necessarily about what was happening in my own club, but my agenda was to open up another fitness facility, and I got these guys in to help me get some hot spots, which you've heard James speak of through the podcast today. So if you're looking at growing your business or perhaps you're wanting to open up a franchise and you're wanting to know where the best area is, please don't play the guessing game. Actually get the guys in to do it because it was quite um, an interesting interesting piece of homework for me and certainly um, made me aware of the do's and don'ts of when choosing a, a location for a second business. So definitely get these guys in. And I will tell you, when they did do the report, it wasn't just pinpointing the lucky street in the suburb that I was looking at. They also told me what demographic would come to my club, what type of equipment I should be putting in my club um, and how long it would be before I got X amount of members and what sort of membership I should be charging. So it's a, it was a great investment and um, perhaps maybe in, later in 2021, 2022, I'll be able to open up that location. But James, right now, please do tell the listeners where they can get a hold of you if they want to pick up the phone. Thanks, Mel. Uh, look, absolutely. James at ActiveX change.org is my email address and um, my mobile is 0466 I'd love a call from anyone but if they just want to have a look at our website activexchange.org and you'll be able to really yeah, have a look at our products, how we work with different partners and collaborators and, and I guess the role that we're playing in evidence and data. Well again thank you James from Active Exchange for this afternoon's Gym Owners Fitness Business Podcast, which is proudly supported by FitRec Fitness Registration for Fitness Professionals and Live Fitness Australia, the number one choice for innovative club member equipment experience. Thank you again, James. Same.